Okay, so my talk is going to be about removing scale from physics, or to use my subtitle that I nicked from Julian's very, very helpful description, I'm going to try and remove the rot from the state of cosmology. Of course, this isn't going to completely work. I'm not going to remove everything, but I am going to make an effort to take away the notion of scale in some sense. There still will be annoying entities, perhaps like the cosmological constant that I won't be able to explain, and I have some ideas about, but that won't come in here. But what I'm going to do is work through ways in which we can realize these ideas. Now, before I go through this, I should definitely mention collaborators here. Obviously, I've discussed this a lot with Julian, and Enrique has been really sort of influential in some of the classical formulation of this. But I'd really like to sort of mention work that I've done with Sean, who has given an excellent talk on the more philosophical aspects of this. Uh, and of course, worked with Flavio and Tim over the last several years, who really sort of taught me how to do shape dynamics. And I'd also like to mention ongoing collaborations with Alessandro Brevetti and Connor Jackman. I know Connor was around a little early. I don't know if he's here still. And Ali unfortunately can't be with us uh, due to a medical appointment, but nonetheless, they are working very hard, um, basically at fixing some of my problems as we go on. And there are a bunch of archive references here. Mostly I'm going to be referring to this third one, uh, which is about cosmology without scale. This is about how to write an action formulation for cosmology, which doesn't involve scale factors. But here are all the references. And I've put archive references up because I know in the era of a pandemic, not many of you will fancy going to libraries and hunting these down. So you can just look up all these papers online. So let me start with the headline. The statement is that within many Lagrangian or Hamiltonian systems, there is going to exist a set of variables that are relational, autonomous, and frictional. And I'm going to make a very bold claim here, and I'm going to claim that these are the empirical content of the theory. These are the shapes. Now, I'm fortunate because I'm a cosmologist. I get to make bold statements and hope no one challenges on me me on them. Whereas if you want really the more careful statements about this, I refer you to Sean's talk where he goes into careful definitions of these things, and particularly to read the paper that he and I wrote where we try and do this a lot more sensitively to issues of language and so forth. Um, I've talked, and my title is about removing scale from physics, but my aim today is to show how to do really cosmology without scale, and I'm going to use this as an exemplar case for how we can do physics in general. The overarching goal, and I think it's one of a lot of us shares, is a fully intrinsic shape description of physics. That means I'm going to be describing all of physics purely in terms of shapes, in terms of perhaps the evolution of one shape with respect to another, and without ever having to make reference back to scale. I am going to be working here uh, because I'm a physicist. I'm going to be working with examples in coordinates, but I assure you that the results that we have are in fact general. Uh, they're highly generalizable, a long way beyond uh, what I'm going to present today, but I'm going to try and give the most pedagogically comprehensible version of this. So working through examples with coordinate systems is I think the best way of doing this. And I wanna say again, um, Ali and Connor, you know, real, actual, genuine, bona fide mathematicians are working hard on the theory to cure both of these problems and to write things in a much more general framework. Okay, so cosmology. Um, this is the undergraduate story. This is the story that Julian particularly objects to about cosmology, and I, as I say, I am very sympathetic to his objection, but nonetheless, this is the hymn sheet I'm going to be singing from when I'm teaching my students about cosmology in about two weeks' time. We talk about cosmology as being the evolution of the scale factor of the universe, so really that the universe has some size, its geometry is described in terms of this size, we have a metric for the geometry of the universe, and we say that all of the cosmological physics is encoded in the behavior of the scale factor. We've made the assumption that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic because that one makes our lives easier and appears to work. 
Uh, but nonetheless, this is very, very useful because it takes our complicated field theories and turns them into effectively like a particle theory. We only have a very few degrees of freedom. However, although we say that the evolution of our basic variables depend on geometry, their behavior is really inferred from observations of matter. What I mean by this is we don't see geometry, we see photons. We see the motion, for example, we infer the motion of distant galaxies from the types of light, the colors of the light that we receive from the stars out there, the redshift. So we don't actually see this geometry, we see matter. And so maybe this geometry doesn't play quite as fundamental role as we've always thought, and certainly something like the scale factor might not. Something we always tell our undergrads, in fact, in the first week of cosmology, we always tell them the overall size of the scale factor is irrelevant. Um, in fact, I think if you read Bob Wald's book on general relativity, he says this, and there's various other books on cosmology, we always say the overall size of the scale factor is irrelevant, and normally but we choose a convention such as setting it equal to one today. This is something we all sort of go along with, something we're all happy about. And when we do our first week of cosmology, we all talk about this. And then we conveniently forget about it when we're dealing with the issues that arise as a result. So what does the theory of cosmology look like? Well, we take the Einstein-Hilbert action and we look at it on one of these Robertson-Walker metrics. So we reduce things to just descriptions in terms of the scale factor A. I'm going to couple this to some matter source. I'm going to keep my matter source to be a generic matter Lagrangian here, uh, depending on some degrees of freedom, some Q, Q dot. Um, this is really the reduction of the Einstein-Hilbert of um, Hilbert action onto this Robertson-Walker metric. When you do these things for the students out there, you've got to be very careful when you symmetry reduce an action. You've got to check the principle of critical uh, symmetric criticality when you do so to find equations of motion. But modulo some mathematical caveat, you can find our equations of motion for our cosmological variables from this. The equations of motion are the usual um, Lagra Euler-Lagrange equations, which turn out to have this interesting extra factor happening to our matter degrees of freedom, we get this extra a dot by a term turning up in what should be the equivalent of the, the Klein-Gordon equation, for example. And we also have an acceleration equation, which tells us about how the scale factor should be changing over time. As an example, if we want to solve this uh, system, we can put in a free master scalar field, and we find the scale factor goes like t to the one third. This is all well and good. And from this, we can find all kinds of interesting behavior. We can observe, we can predict redshift. We can predict um, the distribution of different types of matter in the universe, you know, the, the amount of hydrogen to helium ratios. We can predict the cosmological microwave background, the temperature, all kinds of interesting behavior we get straight out of the back of this. And it seems to work very, very well. So the question arises, how? And why should we try and remove scale from this? Well, I'm very fortunate because I'm giving this talk after Sean and Flavio. And so really they've provided the motivation for me. As you may know, it's traditional in shape dynamics conferences that I go after everyone else. And for some reason then have to answer all the promises that they've made about my talk. But the nice thing is they do my motivation for me. So just to really chime with um, what Sean was saying, and Sean put in much more beautiful language than I ever will. Why do we remove scale? Well, what are the reasons, well, the three primary reasons why I want to remove scale from our system. The first is that scale is redundant. We don't actually need it. As Sean showed in his talk, and I will reiterate in this one, we can remove scale. It's a redundant thing. We don't actually need to talk about scale in order to be able to have an autonomous system that we can integrate. So why keep around this vestigial organ? It's redundant, let's get rid of it. Systems become indeterminate. Particularly, we can have um, a system that fails to be, fails to be uh, our ODE system can fail to be Lipschitz continuous, 
For example, as the scale factor goes to zero, the Big Bang singularity, this means we cannot uniquely continue the system past this point. We can't apply the Picard-Lindelof theorem as we all might like to, and so we can't tell you what happens beyond this point. And the third reason is, frankly, because we can. When you find that you have a different representation of a physical system, you should explore it just because you can do so. Having multiple different representations of the same physical system can often lead to insights in different ways. And so this is something that really we should be interested in. I mean, for me, just because we can do it and it's mathematically curious. And one thing that I want to make clear here is when I say scale is redundant, I mean that this change of scale, for example, the curvature, the Hubble parameter a dot by a is, has physically manifest effects, but the overall value of the scale factor does not. So I could pick a universe in which the scale factor today is one, and Tim might have beautiful reasons for why he wants the scale factor today to be pi, and NEK might have reasons why he wants the scale factor today to be 633, and we can all set these independently and all come up with the same equivalent physical descriptions. That's what I mean by being redundant. Okay, so how about the fact that we can remove scale? How do I demonstrate this? Well, here, what I'm going to do is the case of flat cosmology. So we're just going to have our three space be nice and simple. Uh, for the full version of this, please see the archive paper. Um, the, the maths gets a bit more complicated, but the reasoning isn't. The reason we can uh, remove scale from this system is that there exists a dynamical similarity, like Sean talked about. There is this freedom to make a rescaling um, of the scale factor alone, which isn't going to make a change to matter. So none of these variables q, q dot are actually going to change under one of these uh, transformations, and therefore we can actually eliminate scale. We're going to see that there is an autonomous system within that. And our goal then is going to be to describe this system once we've eliminated this redundancy. So we're going to kick scale factor out. So the reason why you know, we went after this, I went for a, looking for a, a scale three version of cosmology is precisely because we can do it. We know that because there's a dynamical similarity, you find that there should be a reduced autonomous system. And Sean will, um, would argue, and I would agree with him, from the PISA, this tells us we should probably should do it. Okay, so how are we going to do it? Now, this becomes a bit more of a tricky question. We're going to eliminate one degree of freedom. This is completely different from how we normally remove um, fake symmetries. We normally remove two degrees of freedom at, at a time. We normally remove, for example, if a system's invariant under translations and so forth, remove X and PX from the system. Here, we're just going to eliminate one you immediately run into a little issue when you try that in that normally Hamiltonian phase spaces are even dimension. Normally our symplectic, uh, our symplectic systems have even numbers of dimensions in phase space. And so we're going to need some different maths. Particularly, there's going to be something out there in our phase space that doesn't have a conjugate momentum or velocity, depending on how you treat it. This isn't a bug, this is a feature. And in fact, a lot of the interesting behavior, the frictional dynamics, everything we're going to talk about will arise as a result of this difference, the fact that we have an odd dimensional phase space instead of an even one. These things always come with a price, and the price that we have to pay is that this isn't as well known. There is some good, strong, really interesting work being done in this area, but compared to you know, normal symplectic systems, this is a much less explored area of mathematical physics. There's not as well established a route to quantum mechanics, for example. We can't just take Poisson brackets and promote them to commutators because there's an object out there that hasn't got a conjugate partner. There's lots and lots of good work to be done on this. Um, there are going to be relations to things like statistical mechanics. There's relations between open and closed systems and so forth that I won't go into great detail on, but this means that there are opportunities in there for enterprising academics to come and sort of look at this and see what interesting things they can find. Um, Sean and I have been talking about some of the philosophical into, uh, issues that arise as a result of this. Likewise, Kareem, who was here, I'm sure is still around somewhere, and I and um, Stefan Hartman have been talking about some of the implications this has 
um, in terms of treating the universe as an open system versus a closed system. But there are a lot of, lot of interesting bits of work to be done around this that I think, you know, if you're interested in, please get in touch with me because, you know, there aren't many of us working on this at the moment. So it's, it's a nice wide open field and there's good stuff to be found. So how do we deal with odd dimensional systems? Well, there is a beautiful article on uh, the archive by Alejandro Brevetti and collaborators, which gives a lovely overview of how you do this. It's a field called contact mechanics. So normally when we're dealing with a symplectic system, we have some interesting and useful structures, these even dimensional structures. There exist corresponding structures in the odd dimensional systems. They are just normally a little more complicated. In our even dimensional system, we normally have a Lagrangian, which is a function of Q and Q dot, but not S, which for some reason I've left in there. My apologies there, that shouldn't be there. But our Lagrangian is normally a function of some uh, variable in the velocity. The equivalent to this in an odd dimensional system is something I'm calling a Herglotz Lagrangian, which depends not just upon positions, velocities, but also upon the action itself. You can do a Legendre transformation of your Lagrangian and get a Hamiltonian or a contact Hamiltonian, which again will depend on momenta positions and also the action. In a symplectic system, you have a symplectic potential from which you can derive the equations of motion. The equivalent of this is a contact one form, which will live again on this space of P, Q and S. And as Sean talked about, you have these volume forms that will obey Liouville's theorem. They are, you take the symplectic potential, take an exterior derivative and wedge it with itself often enough that it covers your phase space. And that's going to be your conserved volume form. So under time evolution, if your Hamiltonian's time independent, and because we want autonomous systems, we're going to talk about high time independent Hamiltonians. You're going to see that this volume form is conserved under evolution. In an odd dimensional system, you can form a volume form. However, you can't just take the equivalent of taking d eta and wedging it up to cover the whole system, the whole surface. The reason for this is that your system is odd dimensional, d eta is even dimensional. So you have to throw in an extra factor of eta here to get a volume form on your entire odd dimensional phase space. Now, if everything I've been saying here is a little too complicated, don't worry, I will reduce myself to talking about sort of more tangible examples in just a moment, but I really want to emphasize that there are counterparts to all the known useful physics on even dimensional systems that exist in odd dimensional systems. And you even get something new. You get some new structures here. You get a read vector, which becomes something like a vector field on your phase space, which in Darbo coordinates, so simple, easy coordinates, becomes something like d by ds. And this is going to be the key to introducing friction into the system or seeing how friction is manifest in these systems. So let's go through these. What is a Herglotz Lagrangian? Well, a Herglotz Lagrangian, normally you find equations of motion by minimizing an action, which is just a function of q and q dot, say. And from that, from extremizing this action, we get the usual Euler-Lagrange equations. What we're going to do is follow Herglotz and extend this uh, Lagrangian to be a function not just of QQ dot, but also the action itself. Now, if you're thinking what the hell's going on here, S is defined in terms of the integral of a function of S. Don't worry, this isn't some horrible integral equation. It's really just saying dS dt is a function of S. And we're going to min minimize or maximize S subject to a constraint that S dot is some function that includes S. When you do this, you get back something that looks like the normal Euler-Lagrange equations, plus a couple of extra terms that depend on the action itself. And what this tells you is that you're going to get something that acts a little bit like friction. So you're going to get some correction terms to your Euler-Lagrange equations, which introduce friction into the system. And I'll talk about how this is introduced friction or how we know call, why, why I call this friction in just a moment. So once you can deal with Lagrangians, we can make Legendre transforms and deal with Hamiltonians, and you can form a contact Hamiltonian just like you'd form a Hamiltonian. It's just PQ dot minus L. Notice again, 
technical note, I am working in Darbo coordinates. There are more general versions, and in many instances, these are actually more useful, but they're quite mathematically unwieldy to work with. So I'm going to stick to Darbo coordinates for today. But again, for the general versions, I'd advise you to go and read like Alay's paper and go through some of the work that we're doing once we finish it to describe some of this. You get equations of motion from the contact Hamiltonian that look a lot like the equations of motion you'd expect from a Hamiltonian. Q dot is dh dp, but p dot is going to be minus dh dq minus p dh ds. So you get this extra term that acts on momenta and looks again a bit like friction. And why do I say this looks like friction? Well, it turns out your ha contact Hamiltonian is not generically conserved in time. And so if you think about this as being something like the mechanical energy of the system, you find that this is bled out of the system, depending on the sign of DHDS, over time. And so you'll find that these uh, contact Hamiltonians will not be conserved under evolution. So once again, let's talk a little bit about measures. Now, Sean talked about these in attractors, so I won't go into these in great details. But as I put here, you don't get a Dave talk with something about measures and probabilities on, on face space. Um, I spent something like eight or nine years of my early career working on this, so it has to appear in every talk I give. But Liouville's theorem tells you that the volume form is going to be conserved. You can use this to count solutions. And again, about half of my early papers on cosmology were all about this and about the likelihood of inflation that you got just by using this. And there was this real curiosity that arose when we were looking at this and something that really drove me into this area was seeing that although you could define these probabilities by measures on face space, when you tried to pull these onto measures that were in terms of physical observables, all of a sudden you couldn't make a measure that was conserved. Your measure was infinite or it was bleeding some measure or it was changing over time, it was focusing or some combination of the above. And so you found that there, were these, there was this bizarre attractor behavior that you thought shouldn't be around because of Liouville's theorem. The reason why this comes about is because in contact systems, the volume form actually evolves and it evolves according to the equation I've written here, which basically tells you that when you have some dependence on action in your Hamiltonian, you're going to see either focusing or unfocusing of your volume measure. So you're going to see these systems either heading towards or moving away from an attractor solution. That's probably explained about eight years of work and you can recreate it in about an afternoon once you know about contact mechanics, which either makes you feel very good or very bad about yourself, depending on how long you spent working on this. But nonetheless, this leads to a really interesting manifestation of the friction. You see this focusing of the solutions. And again, this gives you this attractive behavior. And as Sean talked about, you can think about this as an arrow of time. You can think about this as being a bit like a thermodynamic arrow of time as well if you want to extend this idea of uh, friction and take this quite literally. There are Janus points. Again, Sean went into these in some detail, so I won't spend long on them. But the point is that because the volume and the Hamiltonian depend on the action, there may be some points where this is where it's where the dh by ds or dh by the action is zero. These will be points at which the system will look locally symplectic. So if the HDA is zero, the extra terms that we got in the evolution of the momentum just falls away. The focusing goes away. The um, bleeding of mechanical energy out of the Hamiltonian goes away. And you'll see what looks like local geodesic motion. You'll see that it just looks like a nice symplectic system. And as I said, away from this point, we're going to focus or expand on time. Uh, sorry, expands. And so think about this as an arrow of time. Again, you can embed these systems back in a larger system in which you introduce scale again, and you recover Liouville's theorem. This tells us that when you see focusing in shape degrees of freedom, you're going to see defocusing in scale and vice versa. But if scale is never part of your system to begin with, you can say, well, this focusing or unfocusing is purely in terms of shape and scale shouldn't be there in your ontology anyway. So as promised, here's an example. Here's the simplest example. I'm a physicist. I am obliged to use harmonic oscillators in my talk. So here is a damped harmonic oscillator. A damped harmonic oscillator has a time independent 
per glotz Lagrangian. You can't write down a time independent Lagrangian for a harmonic oscillator generally, but you can write down a time independent sorry, her glotz Lagrangian for one. It looks like this. It looks like your standard Lagrangian, where we've just added in or subtracted in this case, a term proportional to the action. If you look at the Herglotz Lagrange equations of motion, then it is just the equation of motion of a uh, damped harmonic oscillator. And if you write down the contact Hamiltonian for this, again, it looks like the normal Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator with this extra term that depends on action. And you go through and you say, OK, what happens to this contact Hamiltonian in time? Well, you can show that, again, the fact that h dot is minus mu h means that they just get exponential decay in time, where I think I've missed a factor of m in here somewhere. But nonetheless, you see this exponential decay. You see this loss of mechanical energy from the system. So what happens when you look at volume forms here? Well, your contact form is just minus ds plus pdq. You can't make your contact, you make your volume form by taking eta wedge d eta. So you get the edge dq, s wedge dq wedge dp. And the focusing of this, again, precisely comes about because of this effective friction term. And you see that the attractor is unsurprisingly for a half damped harmonic oscillator, that the system ends up at rest at the origin. So if you set a whole host of these damped harmonic oscillators all going with different initial conditions and left the room and came back a long time later, you'd find they'd mostly ended up coming towards coming to a halt at the origin of the harmonic oscillator. This is the way in which um, I would like to argue that friction is manifest because it is this focusing of this um, set of solutions. If we pop plopped ourselves down anywhere in phase space, a big volume on this phase space, it would have all shrunk over time and again focused in on this origin. Okay, so get to the point, Dave. I've promised you cosmology without scale. Well, how do you do it? Well, you can write down a Herglotz type Lagrangian for cosmology, which never involves scale in the first place. So Julian, um, happy early Christmas. Uh, this is how you can write down an action for cosmology, which never makes reference to the scale factor at all. A is not in there. We don't need it and we're never gonna use it. Again, technical note, I'm handling the flat case here. In the paper, we handle the case where you've got curvatures, but again, you get exactly the same behavior. What is this Herglotz Lagrangian? Well, really, it's just a rewriting of the second Freeman equation. You just set the action equal to minus of the Hubble parameter, and you'll see this is just the equation for h dot. This gives a really tantalizing hint um, about doing general, general relativity in full, is perhaps the action we should be looking for for a shape description of GR in terms of pure shapes should be something like minimize extrinsic curvatures between two slices subject to some constraint. This is a pure conjecture on my part. Um, there is a probably now very worried grad student listening to this who will hopefully be working on seeing whether or not that is true quite soon. The important thing though to take from this slide is that with this Lagrangian, with this setup, we never need to introduce scale into our ontology at all. Everything, all the behaviors that we get come about just due to the fact that the Lagrangian involves the action. And so everything comes from this friction. So what is the Hubble friction? Well, the Herglotz Lagrange equation, again, just tells you that you're going to get the Klein Gordon equation with this extra frictional term in there, which is precisely the cosmological version of the Klein Gordon equation. So whatever matter type we get in there, we're going to get some um, evolution of this matter that's going to include some kind of friction. And that comes about, again, I keep saying this, but it comes about just because we've made this action, that sorry, this Lagrangian that depends on the action. To give you an example of this for inflationary cosmology, like Sean talked about, for if you have put a scalar field in there, you stick a scalar field in with a potential and you get back the exact evolution of an inflaton that we'd all know and love from inflation. Again, I've said you can handle any other types of matter source as well. This is in a recent paper where I go into any types of matter that you care to stick in your cosmology. The important point, and again, I'm, I'm just going to iterate it, is that 
I haven't used the scale factor anywhere in this construction, and I've reobtained all the physical observables and all the behavior exactly as I would have got from the Einstein Hilbert action had I used scale in the first place. So, what about um, a Hamiltonian? Well, the system does have a contact Hamiltonian. Again, you just rewrite the, um, you just perform a Legendre transformation. And you see that the contact Hamiltonian looks just like the Friedman equation rewritten. Okay, this really is uh, just the Friedman equation um, hidden in there. That's precisely what you get when you do the Legendre transform. And the contact form that you get is eta is again minus ds plus p dq. And so you are going to see this focusing or unfocusing of the volume form. And I will refer once again to Sean's excellent talk where he talked about this as potentially being an hour of time and talking about attractors there. And you see, in fact, that inflationary measures do focus on attractors within this. And you don't have to go through all the rigmarole of trying to mod out by scale degrees of freedom or taking infinite cutoffs and so on to make this work. So to summarize this little section or this area on um, Herglot's cosmology, what did we gain and what did we lose? Well, what we lost is that we no longer have a sense of scale. So with that, we lose a very nice geometric interpretation. We're all quite happy with the idea of the universe expanding, modulo Julian, um, but we're all quite happy to use the picture as a good intuition pump that galaxies are moving apart as time evolves and so forth. We also lost our route to quantum cosmology that we usually use. Generally, when people go towards quantum cosmology, what they're going to want to do is take something like the scale factor and the Hubble parameter, promote them to operators and make some commutation relations between them. And this is how you come with to, for example, Wheeler DeWitt cosmology. We don't have this route because we don't have the conjugate uh, velocity to or the conjugate position to the Hubble parameter accessible to us anymore. So our direct route to quantum cosmology may have been lost. Whether or not that's a goal or a feature, uh, sorry, a, a bug or a feature depends on your view of how successful we've been in quantum gravity and quantum cosmology over the past 50 years. So uh, personally, I think we aren't making the progress we'd like. And so perhaps this is a good thing. We can put things back in by hand and solve by quadrature. So in other words, once I've got the full evolution of the Hubble parameter over time, I could say I want to set the scale factor to be equal to one or pi or 639 today and evolve it on the back of this. So we haven't really lost all that much in terms of an intuition and not all that much in terms of a geometric interpretation. But what have we gained? Well, as I keep advertising, we've gained an arrow of time. We've also gained a way to evolve things through the singularity. One of the things that went wrong at the initial singularity is the Picard-Lindelof theorem failed. Well, we can get around that now. We can actually get through that point because we don't have to deal with these zero, zero volume states. And we've gained a more efficient ontology. So again, if you are a fan of the PISA, which I have to be, um, this is the way we should be working. And it's my opinion, and it's, of course it's opinion, but my opinion is that these gains strongly outweigh the losses. We've actually made a step forward by kicking scale out of our system. So the natural question that comes about is, how on earth did you come up with that? What made you think of doing things in this way? How did you find this Herglotz Lagrangian? It seems quite obvious that you can use the second Friedman equation once you start trying, but why did you try that as opposed to anything else? Well, the simple answer to that is that because there exists a dynamical similarity, you can form a contact system. And I show this in a quite dense mathematical paper. Again, one that Connor and Ale are working hard to take all the Davisms out of. Um, but I showed that if you have one of these vector fields on your face space that drag Lee drags the Hamiltonian and the symplectic structure along it, just rescaled, you find that the invariance of these, this forms a contact system. The way you do that is the most trivial way you can think of. You form your contact Hamiltonian by taking your Hamiltonian, saying, how does that scale under uh, dragging along G? Great, let's kick out that many degrees of scale by dividing by some scale variable. 
Likewise, you take a contact form, well, you want a one form, great, let's take the interior product of G with the symplectic form, and again, divide by whatever factor of scale is necessary to make this invariant. And therefore, by hand, I have constructed a Hamiltonian and a contact form in terms of invariance. And you can show just by working with the equations of motion for contact systems that the evolution of the invariants described by this contact form and Hamiltonian are equivalent or exactly equal to the equations of motion that you would get from the original Hamiltonian system, but again, never refer to scale. Um, the vital point that was for this covered by Sean is that these invariants are autonomous. So you can evolve an entire system in terms of these without ever referring back to scale in the first place. So you might think, okay, that's great, but how regularly can you find one of these dynamical similarities? Don't you need a really special system for this to actually happen? Well, in fact, they appear to be almost ubiquitous. As an example, if you take any homogeneous Lagrangian, you're going to find a dynamical similarity. So if you take an n-body system with any type of interacting potential, you're going to find a dynamical similarity. They exist in Bianchi cosmologies, as Flavio talked about in his really good talk on uh, continuing through singularities. And likewise, you find them on, for example, the Schwarzschild interior, precisely for the reasons Flavio mentioned. In fact, you can also handle non-homogeneous Lagrangians. You can handle generic potentials. This is just sort of a very special case. And in fact, there are loads, loads more. Every single Lagrangian that I've managed to come across and sort of throw this system at, I've been able to find within it a dynamical similarity. And again, Connor, if you're here, uh, can probably say a little bit more about this, but it seems like you can almost always find one. Again, if you want an explanation about these, please uh, see Sean's talk or you know, get in touch with your favorite shape person uh, for an explanation. So how do we step beyond these uh, homogeneous uh, Lagrangians? Uh, well, one thing we can do is we can take a system that has um, couplings to multiple uh, different scales. So for example, if I want a Kepler system and to put hook potential in there too, I can do that. And this again, this has gone through in a recent paper and I'm running out of time, so I'll go through this quickly. But there's a trick and the trick is really just to ape what Bekenstein does when he takes uh, makes constants of nature into dynamical variables. You take your constants, so your coupling constants, and you promote them to momenta. If you do this, there's no conjugate position in the Hamiltonian, so under time evolution, these will be constants. Then you just have to specify initial values for these instead of just specifying the constant. So in other words, if I want to take the Newton coupling G, I can replace this in all my equations by pi G. Since the equations don't depend on the conjugate position to pi G, pi G dot is gonna be zero. So these are just still going to be um, constants. They're just specified in terms of initial conditions instead of outside the system. Then we can choose some powers of these. So I can take pi to the power P or pi to the power N or whatever, proportional to the way in which they scale. I then extend my dynamical similarity by acting, by changing G, the, the vector field, to be G primed, which is G plus pi d by d pi. And then you develop then a contact Hamiltonian on the reduced on the constraints. So in other words, any system which has some couplings, you can extend your dynamical similarity to act on those couplings. And this removes all your issues of internal units. What you've done is somewhat of a sleight of hand. You've taken all these constants that you wanted to specify and you've made them initial conditions. But what this does, is it means that then you can identify systems, the Lagrangians, that have different values of the fundamental constants, but nonetheless will have the same uh, relational evolutions. And the equivalent of these constants within the system will now be evolving within your contact re uh, representation just due to friction. Okay, I'm almost out of time, so I'll just go through the rest fairly quickly. Uh, the question then is, how do you get scale back into such a system? Well, you can recover scale by symplectifying. The, sim the way you do this is really quite simple. The contact form is only defined up to a choice of a positive real number. So you can take um, eta to just some number times eta, 
promote this to a variable and make this an extra variable on your face space. Again, this turns out to be conjugate to your action when you do this. And likewise, you can multiply the contact Hamiltonian by this scale. And the result you get in uh, the cosmological case, for example, reveals that what you introduced by doing this was just the volume of the universe. So the simplectification of this system, of this contact Hamiltonian, just gives you back the usual Einstein-Hilbert Hamiltonian, or the Legendre transform this, the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian back. Now, I want to sort of come to the end here, but I want to really first mention what's an interesting curiosity that arises. We can simplectify a contact system to add a dimension. So I can take a system without scale, and I can stick scale onto it. If I do this, I get a symplectic system uh, with scale. But you can also contactify a symplectic system to add a dimension. So in other words, I can take this even dimensional system and say, well, let's add the action as also a variable in my theory. If you do this the simplest way, you take the contact form to be the symplectic potential minus D of the action. And if you take the Hamiltonian to be just the normal uh, pre-existing Hamiltonian and some add some function of the action to it, suddenly you've got a contact system. There is a really fascinating coincidence. And at this point, it's a coincidence to me, but I'd love to understand it in more detail because it's enticing, is that if you take a matter Hamiltonian and a symplectic potential, so if I just have some theory of matter that has a Hamiltonian, and all I do to this is I add some coupling times um, the action squared and take the contact to be the contact form to be the symplectic potential minus ds. You get back from that a system that reproduces Friedman cosmology from this matter source. So you get back not just the evolution of this system in an expanding universe, but you also get the, equate, the expansion of the universe that would result from this matter being present. And so this is really fascinating because it hints that perhaps you get gravitational fact physics just by adding some quadratic friction term to matter. The interpretation of this is really very, very strange because it takes you into a completely different way of thinking about the universe. Instead of thinking about the universe expanding, you can think about the universe undergoing friction. And instead of having a universe that is infinite and expanding or has these you know, interesting but complicated properties to deal with and, and having a closed system, perhaps we should be thinking about the universe as behaving a lot more like an open system. That sounds really weird to begin with because what the hell is outside the universe, right? I mean, the universe should be the ultimate closed system. There's nothing outside the universe. But nonetheless, if you're seeing things like friction being apparent in a system, you're seeing the loss of mechanical energy, you're seeing the focusing of volume forms and so forth, it's behaving like an open system. So perhaps, and this is something Karim Thibault, Stefan Hartman, and I are proposing to look at in some great detail, is perhaps we should be treating the universe a bit more like an open system in some circumstances. Okay, I'll skip through this, but if anyone's interested, you can do this with Bianchi cosmology as well. As promised by Flavio, uh, if you remember the ugliest Hamiltonian in the world that Flavio showed you um, in terms of all A, B, and C, and cube roots and terrible things, if you write this as a contact system, you get this much better looking, nice quadratic Hamiltonian that is all nice and lovely with a contact form again, which is completely written in Darbo coordinates. And you can calculate your equations of motion and continue things through the Big Bang nicely, just directly from this system. Okay, I'll skip through the three or N body problem, but if anyone's interested, I can talk about this, but the exact same thing happens there. And you do get a completely autonomous set of shape dynamics as a result of this. Again, for the benefit of Julian as much as anyone, once you do this, you end up with what you asked for in the first place, which is an evolution of angles written purely in terms of angles. Okay, so let me conclude. We can do classical physics, or at least classical cosmology, and I'm going to be bold and say we can do classical physics without scale. This takes work, right? You've got to learn a new form of contact mechanics, and you get frictional evolutions that you have to think really hard about how to deal with. In doing this, it's brought some gifts with it. It brought with it an arrow of time, and it's brought with it a resolution of the initial singularity. But we're going to have to work really hard to try and find out how we do quantum mechanics on this. But these systems are, as I promised, relational. They're autonomous, and they are frictional. 
So what's the future work? Well, there's a lot of future work to be done. The first thing is that we still need a fully relational replacement for GR. All I've done here is, con is cosmology. GR is a lot harder than cosmology, which is why I'm a cosmologist, but we need to try and expand this. We need the quantum mechanics of these contact systems, perhaps the Lindblad equation and these types of representation of open systems might help with this. We need to understand what are the complete set of structures at singularities. We can currently evolve our solutions through these, but what kind of structures still exist? Do there's still a contact form there? Is there still a well-defined Hamiltonian? What do our spaces look like and so forth? There's open territory to be explored there. And we need a proper full mathematical formulism, which Connor and Ali and I are trying to work like hell on. And a lot of this is coming soon to, yeah, an unfortunate graduate student who knows who he is and he's probably watching this now. Okay, thank you all very much. And please questions, comments, and complaints. It's a very nice talk. So, please, uh, there are already some questions. So, Sahan, please. Hi, Sahan. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the for the talk. It was very informative and clarified some of the questions I had in the past. Uh, and I have a question about the one of the last remarks you made yeah. uh, that uh, you you are open to consider the universe as an open system that's yeah. uh, I, mean, I mean i am open to this idea but you are aware of that that that's that's such a non lacnitzian idea absolutely yeah so it seems look i have to confess when when when, when i first started talking to kareem who's got his hand up and might say more about this about this i thought the idea is a bit insane um and i completely agree that you know it it it, it seems really philosophically broken to say it's an open system but then you say what do you mathematically mean by an open system what you mathematically mean by an open system often is this is a system that either exchanges energy or probability or some quantity may, maybe matter with some external region right and of course yeah. that again seems silly but then you look at these measures and you see that they are focusing and you look at these, the mechanical energy that you see of objects within the universe, and you see that is reducing. And so you say, well, it's behaving like an open system. I mean, perhaps okay. it's not a truly open system in the philosophical sense. You know, we aren't pumping energy out into some bath that's out there outside the universe, but it's behaving like an autonomous open system, which is very, very weird. Okay. And, and isn't it, uh, I mean, you can see it as a sign of, correctness of Newtonian ontology. Can't you see, interpret that as this? You, you tried so hard to, to get all the shape degrees of freedom and get rid of all of the gauges. And at the end, you come up with the results that well, the, the energy is leaking to outside the universe, which means, I mean, the ontology is not being removed. The, the Newtonian ontology is, is showing up there I mean, uh, the, these are just just things to make sense of the results uh, you yeah, have. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you've got a really good point. Um, I think this one is for a better philosopher than me. I have to confess, I am a, more of a cosmologist. I, I lean heavily on Sean for interpretations of these things because uh, he's brilliant at this stuff. But what I will say is that the universe is walking and quacking like a duck. <laughs> so. You know, it, 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 you can, right, with all these systems, with the contact systems, you can simplectify them. You can introduce these extra things to make them closed. But what you're doing is you're introducing inobservable quantities to do so. And so it's a question of which you're more comfortable with. Are you... Dave, can I just tell you your really clever answer? <laughs> that you've forgotten to mention. You, we've also neglecting the coupling between the experimenter's apparatus. Yes, and system, yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. part of the story about how we account for. Yeah, for the... sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kareem. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, the universe is 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 only sort of is, is open in terms of the fact that there is there is an individual within it who's making observations of it, and so you know that's what the closed system is. It's not just. The, um, the universe by itself, but there is an observer within the universe. And can, so- Can I- yeah. Shall I want to make a comment? 
Yeah, I just because you 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 brought oh, yeah. me up. No, but I I think it's just important that to bring up the fact that it's still an autonomous system. Yeah. Right. The system evolves. It, it it only needs to know about what things in this closed system are doing. It just happens to behave like systems that that, that are open. You know, it's just, it's like. Uh, maybe it's a bad word to use, right? It, it's just, okay, we know that open systems have a certain mathematical properties, uh, but that, that, that are shared with the universe in this case, but that doesn't mean that it's open to anything else. It's, it's oh, You can do everything. Yeah. All you need to know is stuff within the universe. So I don't know what Leibniz would think about that. Uh, it's kind of hard to speculate, but... Yeah. Although certainly, I'd like, to, I'd like to hear more of Kareem to talk about my clever ideas and explaining them better than I do. Yeah, I think that was a good point because the word open is somehow, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the word open is doing a lot of heavy lifting there in yeah. ways it shouldn't be. Um, <laughs> but the point is that it, it shares properties in common with open systems. And yeah, so yeah. perhaps when we look for quantizations, we should be looking at what people are doing in open systems. That's so if, how they if, deal with if, if the funding gods smile on us, we'll write yeah. an entire set of papers about explain, articulating and explaining. Yeah, this yeah. No, I think this, this has this has phenomenally interesting consequences. Okay, so since there are many questions, let's move on to the next one. That's uh, Flavio. All right. Uh, thanks, Steve. Beautiful talk. Um, so this uh, suggestion you make at the end that uh, uh, really you might do without uh, uh, geometry per se <laughs> really resonates with you know all the ideas like Ted Jacobson's uh, entropic gravity, the derivation of uh, yeah. uh, Einstein's equations from uh, uh, area laws and stuff like that. Uh, I wonder, uh, is there I wouldn't be surprised if there, if there was a like canonical definition of entropy in contact systems as uh, the amount of energy that went into friction is yeah, there. There is. Right. And uh, yeah. This I think I'm contractually obligated not to say any more about this until Sean's had a good think about it though. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we, this is something Sean and I have been discussing for a while and Sean has great ideas on this, um, but mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know Sorry how great they are, but I, I I don't know how great they are, but I I mean like there are, there are natural choices, and mm -hmm. uh, if for a cosmology you you can actually match it to the um, uh, to the um, uh, what is it when you get to the attractor, it's the um, the uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It starts. I mean, it uh -huh. starts to look like um, something I didn't get time to go into, but it starts to look like the cosmological constant, which can set for you a natural temperature, mm. is actually the late term attractor, and so your distance yeah. from the universe, in which that is the horizon, can give you a temperature. And yeah, there are all kinds of yeah, there's cool stuff that could come about here, which you but it's don't work have in, access yeah. to. Yeah. It's work in progress, and I, yeah, yeah. I think it's better not to comment before I change yeah, my mind yeah. about we'll, 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 it. Yeah. Okay. If anyone has a better <laughs> idea on that, uh, feel free to scoop us, but cite me. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to um, Karim's question. Uh, so I, I was really fascinated when you said about promoting coupling constants to variables. Yeah. What happens if we promote other constants like? A cosmological constant, speed of light. Yeah. Will something similar happen in those cases? Because obviously, you know, my insurance, a lot of our work is based on promoting the cosmological constant. Yeah. I've also just been reading more generally about the way we interpret constants. And there's some really lovely stuff by Le Levy LeBlond. And yeah. he, seen, he argues that the differences between fundamental constants and coupling constants changes over time. Yeah, and so if we could reinterpret other constants that way, what, what would the implications be? So this is, yeah. Again, I don't want to prejudge or pre, 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 pre give away too many things that um, Ale, Con Connor and I are working on, but just to give you sort of a preview of this a little bit. What you, when you have a symplectic system, you can take any, anything that's constant, you can take pi, right? And literally the value of pi and promote it to a momentum and just give that an initial value. 
But then you want to say, how can I look at equivalent systems where this had different values? Now, it'd be stupid to do with this with pi, or very, very clever, clever than I am. But you know, suppose you did this with Newton's constant or something like this, or, or any other constant you like. Um, this will still be constant in the symplectic theory, but in the contact theory, it will look like a variable. It will look like something that evolves, but it evolves once in a very prescribed way, it decays. It's what Ale calls a friction, frictional constant or a decaying constant. He's got- So this is an incredibly powerful heuristic just to spit yeah, yeah. out new contact theories by taking, picking a constant and then you can basically construct a new theory where it varies. Is that, you, is that no, what you so, so what happens is the representation of it in contact theory varies, but then when you re embed this within a scale system, you make it constant again, effectively. Now, what you can then do is something that's really neat is the way in which you introduce scale can allow you to choose what appears to be constant within your new symplectic theory. So you could come up with a scale, a the theory in which um, G is constant, G Newton is constant. But there's probably a theory out there in which G Newton is varying, but something else is constant. And then what you find when you, for example, project onto a shape space, what you see when you do this with multiple constants is when you throw away scale, it's the equivalent to saying the universe or the, the size of the system is staying the same, but the ratio of Newton's constant to Hooke's constant, for example, for a spring constant is changing. And so as time goes on, one of these is becoming more and more important. And then things evolve and the system maybe gets smaller and Newton's constant gets more and more important. And so depending on how you embed these, you get to choose between what you want to look constant and what you want to vary. And so it gives you a different ontological picture. And this is really interesting. I mean, so the equivalent you can do cosmologically, uh, which is where I always fall back because it's where I'm safest, is that you say the, we always talk about the ratio of um, dust to radiation or dust to dark energy and so on changes over time, right? And one of these becomes the dominant form of matter and that's where the universe is expanding forever. And we put that down to the universe expanding. But you could also embed this within a system where the universe kept a constant size and just lambda was getting bigger over time. That's absolutely, you know, allowable and will give you an equivalent description of physics that is observably indistinguishable. There's lots of great work on this from a similar perspective, but completely different, similar outcome, different perspective by Vetrish. If you send me the references, that would be great. Yeah, I'll look those up and send them through to you, yeah. So there's one more question by uh, Vasu. Then this is the... Final question. Hi, hey, hey, Dave. Thank you for this interesting talk. Uh, sorry, I only caught the latter half of it. No worries. But um, yeah, this is maybe a little bit open ended. But um, a lot of this context stuff reminds me of uh, the kinds of techniques people use in stochastic quantization, where you, you know you you add a sort of dimension. Okay, there you're not quite doing this um, on phase space, but uh, nevertheless, uh, there's a way to sort of account for um, well, things like friction, except it's a different source of friction. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you've thought about um, some segue into stochastic processes and <laughs> that, that kind of, those kinds of tools. If yeah, a, a, a little bit. Um, I mean, basically I'm waiting for Kareem's funding gods to give us the chance to do this. Uh -huh. Yes, it, it would okay. be lovely if we got more of a chance to look at this. Cause I, I mean, even if we don't look, this is, it's it's to me a fascinating and enticing new ontology, right? It's a it's it's a really yes. different way to to look at things, and so um, whether or not it's physically the most interesting in all circumstances, I don't know. But if it starts spitting out new ideas or new ways, new perspectives, I think that could be really interesting. Sorry, not to give you a better answer than that, but you know, it's all good. <laughs> um, talk to me more about it because you know, yeah, more work on this would be great. 